Great. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming to this very exciting event to discuss this very exciting book. Um, my name is Lucas Slavus. I'm an LSE fellow. Um, and I just have to quickly say that this event is very generously sponsored and basically fully paid for um, by LSE 100, which is uh, the department I work in, which is an interdisciplinary um, undergraduate course taught here at LSE that tackles some of the key questions of our time, like climate change, artificial intelligence, and how to build a fair society. So it's quite a good home for, for this event, I think. Um, so uh, I'm very excited for today's discussions, for the presentation, the, the respondents, and for the Q&A we'll have with the audience afterwards. Um, so I don't want to do too long introductions, because um, I do want to give the floor over to everyone else. Just a, a couple of logistical points. Um, Fire experts are here. Uh, yeah, here. So if there is a fire, that's where you, that's where you go. I uh, will just panic, and then we'll uh, we'll find a way out. Um, if you do need the toilet, it's kind of all the way across the other side of the, like across the basically the, the um, kind of main space outside. So it's quite far. Um, and yeah, please also after the event, we're I know there's quite a few of us, but we will probably go to uh, the, like one of the LSC pubs just. Um, outside the building, so please do join for a drink if you want to, and if you have time, and you know, might, maybe you'll get a chance to, to chat to our lovely speakers as well. Um, so, yeah, so the book we're here to discuss today and to hear more about is uh, Mute Compulsion, uh, which I have to just first of all say I enjoyed so much and I think is an incredibly important contribution to political theory, philosophy, and to social science more generally, and it's the kind of thing. Um, I was talking to a friend uh, yesterday, actually, that we were saying, both of us, that this is the kind of book that we wish we had when we started our PhDs um, to read, to kind of orientate ourselves um, in terms of like what is actually possible to do as kind of good uh, and important uh, scholarship. So um, I hope um, you know, that you will enjoy it, those of you who read it, and those who haven't, that you're excited to hear more about it. So um, our kind of, uh, the, the star of the show today is, of course, Soren Mao, who's uh, joining us here from Denmark. So thank you very much for, for uh, coming across um, the pond, the smaller pond, uh, as it were. Um, so Soren is a postdoctoral fellow at Aarhus University um, in Denmark, and he's currently working on a research project called Philosophical Anthropology uh, for the Capitalocene. Um, he's also a member of the board of the Danish Society for Marxist Studies um, and, of course, uh, the author of this very important book. Um, Søren will speak for, I think, about 20 minutes-ish um, about the kind of key themes of the book first, and then uh, we'll hand over to our uh, discussants. So, um, this, the eagle eye of you will have noticed there's a third person missing, right? So, uh, so Sumi Madak is joining us in just a few minutes. Uh, she had uh, just an urgent meeting to go to. Uh, but Sumi is a professor of political theory and gender studies in the gender studies department here um, at LSE. And we have Sarah Salem, who's an associate professor in the department of sociology. And we have uh, Paul Apostolidis, who's a professorial lecturer in the department of government. So we've kind of covered lots of our bases um, uh, in terms of uh, disciplines. So, yeah, we will get started, um, and at the end, you know, when they will spoken, there'll be time, plenty of time for, for a Q&A, for discussions, uh, comradely critique, uh, uh, and any kind of, uh, you know, kind of pressing issues you want to discuss, but please do try and keep your questions short, uh, you know, don't start with the, you know, this is more of a, a comment than a question, <laughs> let's try and actually do questions. Um, but yeah, so uh, just to let you know, this event is being recorded, so if anyone uh, objects to that, I'm afraid you're going to just have to leave. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, so the event will be made available online afterwards, you can share with friends, colleagues, um, and anyone who might be interested. So yeah, without further ado, let's hand over to Sarah. Lucas, um, thanks to all of you for coming, um, and thank you to Sarah and Paul and Sumi um, for agreeing to do this and for reading my book. I'm very honored to have you as my readers, and I'm um, looking forward to hear your perspectives. So um, I will try in the next 15 to 20 minutes to give an overview of some of the most important arguments in the book. And um, the central idea is that the capitalist mode of production 
um, generates a number of impersonal, abstract, and anonymous mechanisms of domination uh, that helps to reproduce the capitalist system. And my book is an attempt to build a theory of this uh, form of power, which I call economic power or mute compulsion. And mute compulsion is an expression um, uh, I have from Marx, uh, who uses it once in uh, one of the last chapters of Volume 1 of Capital. I'm just going to read you the, read the quote um, where, I, uh, which, uh, where I took the title from. Um, so Marx writes, and I quote, The mute compulsion of economic relations seals the domination of the capitalist over the worker. Extra economic immediate violence is still, of course, used, but only in exceptional cases. In the ordinary run of things, the worker can be left to the natural laws of production. That is, it's possible to rely on his dependence on capital, which springs from the conditions of production themselves and is guaranteed in perpetuity by them. So that's the basic idea uh, of the book, and um, that's where the title is from. Um, so it's a, um, it's a theory developed on a quite high level of abstraction, uh, so it's not an attempt to uh, present an analysis of a particular uh, historically specific capitalist society. It's an attempt to say something about capitalism as such, or the essence of capitalism. It's, it's an attempt to um, build a theory of forms of power which are uh, at play in all forms of capitalism, all capitalist societies, regardless of their uh, geographical and, and historical variations. Um, and I build on insights from Marx and from a lot of different writings from his critique of political economy, um, and combine that with a lot of research from a lot of um, different Marxist thinkers and traditions and, and non-Marxist uh, scholars and thinkers. And this idea that capitalism relies on a, or implies an, an impersonal and abstract form of power is obviously not a new idea and it's not, it's not something that is buried in obscure manuscripts, uh, Marx manuscripts or anything like that as, as um, uh, the quote I just uh, read uh, is from Capital and it's, so it's, it's very clearly described in some of Marx's most well-known works, and there have and, and lots of Marxists have written about this uh, since Marx. So it's not like I claim that I discovered something new about uh, capitalism, um, but I think that and I and I actually kind of I, I think of the book as an attempt to collect uh, what has been written about this and to combine this to 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 a, a, a more comprehensive theory of the economic power of capital. Um, so a lot, lot of people have, have uh, written about this, but nevertheless, I think that there has been a tendency in Marxism to um, focus more on other forms of power, uh, especially violence and ideology. And I think that violence and ideology are extremely important forms of power that are necessary uh, in order for capitalism to exist. So my claim is not to say that other people have focused on violence and ideology and it's actually not that important. What is more important is the economic power uh, of capital. It's, it's what I want to say is, is that um, I think violence and ideology are necessary and extremely important, but in addition to that, there's also a third form of power, which, is, which, which cannot be reduced to ideology uh, or violence, which is something else, and it's a form of power that um, works by shaping the social and material environment we exist in and, and, and the context within which we um, make choices. Okay, so let me try to um, summarize some of them, some, some important arguments from the book. One of the 
most important reasons why the power of capital takes the form of a mute compulsion of economic relations is um, the specific character of capitalist class domination. And this is a very familiar idea for Marxists that in contrast to pre-capitalist forms of class domination, capitalism is based on the permanent separation of producers from the means of production. In other words, capitalism is premised on a universal proletarianization or the, the transformation of uh, um, a large part of the population into propertyless <laughs> proletarians. Um, so the control of the conditions of social reproduction is centralized in the hand of a small elite and the violence necessary to maintain this uh, state of affairs is centralized in the state. Um, which means that as a general rule, the exploiting class does not need to employ violence in order to force other people to perform surplus labor. Uh, instead, they can usually rely on the fact that it's necessary to let oneself be exploited in order to survive, which is um, the crucial and perhaps the most fundamental meaning of, the, of what mute compulsion is, um, that in capitalism, most of us are forced to uh, let ourselves be exploited. Um, and so, so that's, the, the, that's the kind of fundamental class domination which is necessary for capitalism to exist. And, and, and it's important to note that um, in this uh, form of class domination, it's not just it's not just wage laborers who are subjected to this. It's it, it, it's uh, capitalism is based on a class relation between capitalists and proletarians, and proletarians are uh, it's not just wage laborers who are subjected to this class domination. It's all proletarians, regardless of whether or not they work, and also if they work, regardless of whether or not it's in the form of wage labor or other forms of labor, informal uh, labor, and uh, also unpaid labor, domestic labor, for example. So another significant and defining uh, thing about capitalism is that production is organized by private and independent producers who exchange their products as commodities on the market. In other words, uh, capitalism is a market economy. And the market um, generates economic mechanisms, which I think we should regard as power mechanisms. So uh, competition is a power mechanism. The price mechanism is uh, a power mechanism. Um, and, the, and, and price movement, the movement of prices, for example, I think we should regard as an expression of the power of capital. And it's... It, it, it doesn't have, it, it's, it's usually not possible to point to a specific person or institution who has uh, made a decision about that. But it, so it's a, in that sense, it's an anonymous form of power and it shapes the context we live in. So it makes us do, it forces us to do certain things and is a part of the mechanisms that reproduce the power of capital. So. Market pressures are power, and what the market circulates is not information, uh, as uh, mainstream economists would uh, say, but uh, commands issued by capital. So that's how we should uh, see price movements, I think. I think. Um, so these two sets of relations, the vertical relation, the class relations between capitalists and proletarians, and the horizontal relations between um, market agents between workers who s sell their labor power and compete in the labor market and between individual capitals that compete in the market. These two sets of relation uh, taken together explain why the power of capital takes the form of a mere compulsion of economic relations. But there's more to the economic power of capital than that because these relations set in motion certain uh, dynamics or tendencies that uh, show themselves over time. So what Marx calls laws of motion. Um, and these dynamics are on the one hand an effect of 
the relations I just described, but on the other hand, they are also one of their sources. So there's a paradoxical circularity about uh, in, in, the, in the power of capital in the sense that one of the sources of this uh, form of power is its own exercise. Um, so I want to briefly mention uh, three um, such dynamics that are uh, uh, effects of capitalist relations of production, but also uh, tends to reproduce those very same relations. The first one is what Marx calls real subsumption, which is which can be described, I think, as a material, the constant material reconfiguration or restructuring of the production process. And this is something that takes place on all levels of the capitalist economy. It takes place in the workplace and the labor process, for example, by introducing new technologies in order to uh, increase productivity or uh, con uh, control workers, um, new forms of uh, uh, organization uh, of the workplace, new uh, divisions of labor, changing the division of labor, and so on. That's, that's, uh, those are all examples of real subsumption in the, of the labor process. Um, in the workplace, but it also takes place in capital's relation to nature, not just within the uh, production process in a narrow sense, in the labor process, but also uh, so in, the, in the production process, it takes the form, for example, of uh, breeding of animals and, and, and plants to make more profitable uh, agricultural products, for example, uh, to increase productivity, but also by shaping landscapes, for example, through infrastructural projects. That's also an example of how capital reconfigures the natural surroundings to make it more um, uh, conducive to uh, uh, profits, um, to, to capitalist production. Um, real subsumption, so real subsumption takes place in capital's relationship with labor and with nature, and it also takes place on a on the level of the totality, of, on, on, a, on a global level, for, for example, through uh, logistics technologies and through um, yeah, transport technologies and logistics, and, and, and which makes it possible to reshape the uh, international division of labor, which is also a kind of real subsumption that, that gradually creates a uh, production apparatus which is uh, less and less compatible with other ways of producing than the capitalist one. So it, so it, so it makes it increasingly difficult to establish another uh, mode of production. So that's why it strengthens the power of capital. Um, in, in the book, I, um, I, I spent uh, uh, some time discussing two examples of this. The one, one, of, one of them is um, the development of agricultural production in the second half of the 20th century, and the other one is the logistics revolution. Uh, the, so the, yeah, the revolutions in the logistics sector and how that has affected the global economy since the 1970s. So that was uh, one of the um, dynamics I wanted to mention. And the, the second one is the tendency in capitalism to or capital's tendency, necessary tendency to generate a, to create a relative surplus population. So capital, capitalism necessarily uh, excludes uh, people from, number of people from the circuits of capital and uh, make them superfluous um, to the, from the point of view of capital uh, or capitalist production. And um, that increases Competition among workers uh, puts downward pressures on wages and so on, and that's one of the reasons why it strengthens the power of capital. So I also think that that is one of, that should be regarded as one of the mechanisms of economic power. Um, and uh, the third um, dynamic I want to mention is crises. I also think that we can uh, s that we should regard crises as a as one of the way, as a, as a as a mechanism that helps uh, a crisis. A crisis is uh, an expression and a result of the fundamental contradictions of capitalist production, um, but it also um, generates mechanisms that 
restore the conditions for a new round of accumulation and uh, uh, restore the conditions for uh, profitable production. So I'm and I'm not trying to reduce crises to uh, just an, a, a, an internal self-regulating aspect of the capitalist system. It's not only that, but it can also be that, and it's often that. So um, yeah, so these dynamics, real subsumption, surplus populations, and uh, uh, crises are also a part of the economic power of capital, and I and that's that's like the basic. Uh, that was a, a kind of an outline of the basic ideas in the book. Uh, so, uh, the mutual so the power of capital takes the form of a mutual compulsion of economic relations because of a set of historically specific social relations and the dynamics that are, on the one hand, an effect of these relations, but also helps to reproduce them. And um, yes, I think I'll stop there. Thanks. Great. <laughs> Thank you so much, Saren, uh, and welcome also to Sumi. Uh, <laughs> perfect timing, actually. Um, so that was pr pretty good timing. Um, so let's move on to our three respondents now. So um, any particular order? Hold them first. I'm happy to. Great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you go first. Then. Okay. All right. Great to see this turnout. Thanks to everybody for coming, and thank you, Lucas, for organizing, and thank you, Cern, for this, uh, for this amazing book. Um, so I'm, I'm really grateful to have had the chance to read and think carefully about Cern's book, not least because I specialize in the kind of critical theory that Cern explicitly notes he is not doing in this text. <laughs> My own approach puts concepts from academic theory into dialogue with experiences and accounts of power formulated by working people, which I identify through ethnographic fieldwork, mainly with Latino communities in the United States. CERN's book has led me to re-examine the assumption that I tend to make that the more concrete theory is, the sharper its critical edge will be. I was initially skeptical of CERN's enterprise, <laughs> um, because as he clearly explains, um, he is deliberately taking an abstract approach to isolate the dynamics of power that are proper, proper to capital as such. Um, I've come away from the book convinced that there is genuine value in understanding several core aspects of capital-specific power as Surin theorizes them, drawing on close, careful readings of Marx. Now, the first is Surin's argument that the, quote, human corporeal organization is such that there is always mediation between human bodies and non-human nature. For Surin, this is the key to understanding the metabolism between humans and nature, about which much interesting and urgent theory is being written right now in these days of escalating climate change. The body's ambiguous relation to its tools and other means of reproduction then also creates the opening for capital to insert itself in the midst of social reproductive processes and exercise such mediation in the mode of domination, Surin argues. Well, I think this approach has the virtue of locating social reproduction at the very basis of capital's power, and thereby setting the stage for a broadly inclusive anti-capitalist politics. It also offers a compelling orientation for developing eco-socialist theory in politics, because it clarifies why it's important to resist any romantic desire to recover a supposed lost unity between humanity and nature. Instead, as Surin writes, we should see the lack of such immediacy as, quote, a sign of the human's infinity, in the sense that it enables humans to socially mediate their relation to the rest of nature in an infinite number of ways. I also applaud Surin's intervention in the long-running debate over whether theory should emphasize capitalist class domination or capitalist domination of society as a whole. Others have argued before that both kinds of domination need to be recognized and studied and politically engaged. Uh, for instance, uh, Albina Asmanova in her recent book, Capitalism on Edge. But Soren adds more specifically, and I think helpfully, that a vital source of capital's power lies in taking advantage of the intersections and the interrelations between these two formations of domination. So on the one side, he argues that capital needs and enacts the relation of class uh, domination as, quote, the relation between those who control the conditions of social reproduction, 
and those who are excluded from the direct access to the conditions of social reproduction. Note how it's blocked access to the conditions of social reproduction rather than the sometimes more familiar, uh, narrower notion of lacking ownership of the means of production that proletarianizes, according to Søren. He offers uh, also an illuminating account, I think, of the multiple temporal registers of the proletariat's dependence on capital for social reproduction, emphasizing the ways that the past and future rule over the present uh, in a system where, quote, life itself comes with an obligation to valorize value. And on the other side, these vertical relations of class domination are in a co-generating relation um, with the horizontal relations through which capital's rule extends over society in general, through intra-class frictions and negotiations, above all through logics of competition. Uh, the market, Søren thus argues, quote, not only mediates and conceals relations of domination, it also is a domain within which domination actively subjugates people because it's in the market where uh, people are strenuously disciplining each other to adapt to capital's control over access to social reproduction by behaving competitively. Now here I can offer an example of one way that I think Søren's theory can inform a more grounded perspective on contemporary work and struggle. So I've done recent empirical research with several groups of workers who engage in extremely contingent uh, uh, forms of employment. So day laborers, Amazon warehouse workers, and micro-workers, or people who do online tasks, earning pennies per click to facilitate machine learning processes. Um, together with James Muldoon, who's here, uh, we did a study of micro-workers in the UK and found that micro-workers in this country spend on average about 20 minutes out of every hour of work time just scrolling through lists of posted jobs before they actually do any paid labor. Søren's analysis helps us see that the problem is not just that um, these workers are doing an excessive amount, um, at least by my lights, of unpaid work to get work. Right? It's also that all that unpaid time is spent immersed in the labor market and thus exposed to domination through that market activity. And the same goes for day laborers who typically spend four or five days a week um, waiting unsuccessfully for jobs out on street corners in the US uh, and warehouse workers at Amazon who use an app each day at designated hours to try to find out what jobs are available and then to try to beat each other out to get the best posts. These, this leads me to a question. Uh, Søren, would you agree that under variable historical conditions, certain drivers of capital's power will operate more intensively than in other periods? Could we say that here about the expansion of labor market participation time and perhaps use this as a way to characterize what's special about the current period of heightened precarity. Also, to gauge the significance of work to get work for capital's power even more generally, might you agree that it is also important to investigate how such labor market time impacts working people's non-waged social reproductive time, relationships and resources? Um, I'm finding, for instance, um, that inflated job search time for Amazon's <coughs> online and warehouse workers is displacing and colonizing the time that workers otherwise would spend caring for themselves and others, or just doing other things apart from earning money or doing care work. Now, as he mentioned, Søren also highlights capital's real subsumption of social relations as a crucial aspect of capital's power. This is the way, he says, that capitalism, that capitalist processes create innumerable new kinds of human skills, coordinated activities, technologies, and products, which are shaped through and through by capital's needs and tailored to the requirements of a specifically capitalist society. Søren gives a disturbing example of genetically engineered suicide seeds, which, quote, produce completely sterile plants, um, and hence an annual need to buy new seeds from agribusiness giants like Monsanto, um, to illustrate how real subsumption uh, forges a distinctly capitalist material environment from which detachment, as he said, becomes increasingly difficult. I think the concept of real subsumption also works extremely well to clarify um, and describe what's going on in Amazon's fulfillment centers uh, today. So warehouse workers whom I interviewed in California stressed how specialized and non-translatable 
the tasks and terminologies are which govern the work of unloading containers and picking items to fulfill uh, orders. Mantina Bagonses of NYU argues that Amazon's global logistics network could and should be brought under, quote, direct public ownership and oversight so that it could serve, quote, the interests of the working class. Her idea is that if you just removed Amazon's notorious surveillance technologies uh, and shifted control to the state, this enormous distributional apparatus would enable human need satisfaction in emancipatory ways. But as Soren's discussion of real subsumption helps us to see, this ignores how the architecture of the warehouses, the machinery, the bespoke abilities needed to operate it, all of these things literally embody the goals of profit maximization and success in market competition. Now, Soren's analysis of real subsumption provoked another question for me. So, Soren, given the prominence that you give to social reproduction throughout the book, I was puzzled that you see processes of real subsumption real subsumption as strictly limited to the sphere of commodity production, if I'm reading you correctly and saying that. Should we not also explore how reproductive relationships, practices, and resources are molded to fit specifically capitalist processes? Our interviews um, with James here show that microworkers incorporate wage earning and job seeking into nearly all dimensions of their reproductive lives. So if you get in the habit of scrolling for jobs, or making a flurry of income generating clicks when the baby takes a nap, while you're cooking, while you're eating, while you're cleaning, while watching football, or at night when you can't sleep. And hasn't your reproductive activity been subsumed by capital? I'm gonna conclude with three further comments and questions, um, ignoring Lucas's uh, admonition not to give <laughs> comments. <laughs> First, um, although I'm persuaded by much of your arguments, sir, and I think the book's treatments of violence and ideology needed more nuance. I question what I see as a, uh, a rather too pat periodization that places violent dispossession in the past, superseded by operations of mute compulsion that stem from capital's economic logics of power. Lush Insha here at SOAS offers um, an alternative theory of primitive accumulation as an ongoing process that violently separates working people from the conditions of social reproduction, um, which I find more persuasive. Um, for example, I think it helps make sense of how warehouse development uh, that displaces Southern California Latino communities today and that raises Latino death rates from respiratory illness, uh, this constitutes a new chapter within a long-term history of imperial and colonial violence. Second, um, the main thrust of this book is on the negative constraints that capital imposes on working people to make their productive and reproductive activities conform to the imperative of continuous value creation. And yet, capital also generates distinctive kinds of pleasures and fulfillments, aesthetically, materially, emotionally, all the beauty and abundance that coexists in contradiction with all the misery and the want. As my collaborator at the University of California Riverside, Alfonso Gonzalez stresses, this is why there are so many Latino conservatives in Southern California, entrepreneurs, border patrol agents, police officers, even as the vast majority of Latinos cycle through high turnover, uh, dangerous warehouse jobs. I'm not sure whether it would work better to expand your category of economic power or to complicate your treatment of ideology to take account of these dynamics, but I don't think that they're of peripheral or secondary importance in an analysis of capitalist power. And then third and last, Soren, you underscore how you don't think any particular political program can be drawn from an abstract critique of capital's abstract power. You also acknowledge that anti-capitalist political projects have to engage with historically developed patterns of racial and gender subordination and their entanglements with capitalist um, processes. But you leave it ambiguous how exactly this should happen in the context of the communist politics that you endorse at the book's very end. So I'm curious about what you mean when you invoke communism, right? What roles uh, might you envision for feminist and anti-racist politics in particular within communist organizing? And how the appreciation for capital's power in the abstract that you give us would inform such efforts. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You don't mind?
Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you uh, for coming. Thanks, Lucas, for organizing. And thank you, Soren, for writing this uh, really fascinating book. I did not make the font big enough on this. I'm going to hold it in front of me. So this is a book uh, Soren has mentioned about one of the most pressing questions of our time, which is why and how is capitalism surviving? So why hasn't it collapsed yet, as now puts it? Not only is it still with us, but it seems to have encountered crisis after crisis, only to come out stronger at the end. As the book notes, after the pandemic, we're still in the pandemic, but pretended that we're after the pandemic, so I'm just using that language. We're left with more billionaires, more millionaires, more inequality, more militarized police forces, and, and so on. So the collapse of capitalism seems further away than ever, even though at times, especially over the last decade, it seemed just around the corner, for instance, during very crucial moments of resistance, uprising, strikes, revolutions, and so on. And this produces a strange sense of time and that capitalism is defining our future very clearly while we wonder if capitalism itself has a future. The Mute Compulsion of Capital explores this question of capitalism's power by centering the ways in which capitalism has changed the way that we live and our environments. So acknowledging the power of violence and the power of ideology now posits this third tendency, uh, that of economic power, that's as important in understanding how capitalism remains so powerful. By changing the social, political, economic, environmental conditions of life, capitalism makes other forms of living difficult, if not impossible. So he writes, quote, there's no doubt that capitalism would be impossible without the constant presence of ideological and coercive power, but there's more to the power of capital than that. Violence, as well as ideology, direct the subject, um, address the subject directly, either by forcing bodies to do certain things or shaping the way in which these bodies think. Economic power, on the other hand, addresses the subject only indirectly by acting on its environment. So it's rooted in the ability to reconfigure the material conditions of social reproduction, end quote. So taking part in capitalism then is not a choice in any form, but nor is it the simple result of ideology or violence, though these often play a role. It's equally about there simply not being any other choice or any other way of building a life outside of the confines of capitalism. <coughs> I found the book rich and intriguing and very enjoyable to read, which, as I told Soren, is very special for a book about Marxist theory. Uh, <laughs> extremely well written and uh, easy to get through. And one of its core strengths, I think, is, actually, is the way that it sketches out many, many Marxist debates um, simultaneously bringing them into conversation with our contemporary moment. There's a very generous engagement with a lot of different bodies of literature, um, including non-Marxist literature. So for example, I found the sections where you think with Foucault and what Marxists can take and might not want to take from Foucault really engaging. The first part of the book also covers some of the limitations of conceptualizations of power, including those that are very dominant in disciplines like sociology, that don't really want to take the informal or invisible dynamics of power seriously. Another strength is the kind of focus on abstract theory, but also the places where you talk about how this comes up against or in relation or how it acts in relation to more grounded examples. And I think here, um, this debate the book raised for me specifically about how political questions can't be resolved at either level simply, but need to be in conversation with both this kind of more abstract level of theory, but also the kind of everyday politics that are all around us, I think is a really interesting thing that came out of reading the book. Um, and so I agree with Lucas, it's a, it's a great book and I wish I had read it earlier, um, but it's good if you're considering becoming a Marxist, if you're not already, <laughs> to start with this book. Um, so for the rest of my time, I just I wanted to pose a few questions. I think some are more about um, a curiosity that came out in relation to some parts of the book where I was just curious to hear more of your thoughts rather than a, I wish this book had been <laughs> about something else. But others, I think, are more directly about some of the ways in which um, your conceptualizations might have uh, specifically impacts on how we imagine politi the political or political resistance, so building on what Paul ended with. 
So my first question is about resistance. Um, reading the book, I found myself kind of constantly returning to this question of resistance and what it means to challenge capitalism when we understand it as made up of these three different um, spheres or tendencies. So I didn't read it as a book about that was defeatist or that was about kind of the impossibility of life outside of capitalism. Um, in fact, I read it as the opposite. Um, and this is despite the fact that although you give some examples of resistance movements, there wasn't a lot explicitly on the implications of this analysis for political resistance. And I know, as Paul mentioned, that perhaps this wasn't the aim of the book. But I wonder if you could speak more to how we might think about resistance, particularly in this moment, if we take this concept of economic power seriously. So what would it mean about Marx's strategy or communist strategy? Uh, how might we think of it also in relation to kind of the growing, I'm thinking here in the UK, the large number of strikes we see all around us. Um, so what would an anti-capitalist strategy against economic power look like? Or what does it mean to disrupt something like economic power? I think that was something that I was really left with at the end of that. Um, and related to this, and it builds a little bit on what, Paul, you started your talk with when you said uh, the sharpness of the abstract can actually be really useful sometimes. And I completely agree as someone who tends to lean much more towards the concrete that I was really struck by how a lot of the analysis that happened at this more abstract level was really fascinating and helped me think about a lot of questions. Um, at the same time, I wonder if there are instances where the sharpness of the concrete also becomes very important or matters just as much. And I was thinking here, particularly in your discussions, both about the global or about how we might think of how the global south, for instance, fits into the history of capitalism, but also the chapter on difference, so where you think through these questions of gender and race. Um, and I know in that chapter you acknowledge that you know some political questions can't be resolved at this more abstract level, that uh, we need to think of them in their context at a more grounded level. Whereas other mo moments, I think, more space is given to this more abstract level. And I was interested again in this chapter on difference, on what this privileging allows you to do. So the privileging more of kind of working out the debate at a more abstract level rather than thinking through maybe the more historical uh, question of history, I guess. So for instance, despite the fact, you talk a lot about social reproductive work in this <clears throat> chapter, the fact that most of it throughout history has been done by <coughs> Um, but that this does not mean that there's a necessary relationship between gender and capitalism. So in other words, something else could have happened, other vectors of structural inequality could have become deeply entangled with capitalism instead, or another group could have done this reproductive labor, for instance, instead of women. So at a certain level of ab abstraction, I think there may be no necessary relationship, yet this is, this is a relationship that has overwhelmingly been established historically. And so historically, we do know that most of this labor has been done by women. And similarly, we could say, although the relationship between capitalism and racism similarly might not analytically have been necessary in a particular way, we do know that historically, the foundation of kind of capitalist accumulation has relied largely on histories of racism, colonialism, and so on. And you point out towards the end of the chapter that even if we come to certain conclusions analytically, so that there may be no necessary relationship between gender and capitalism, this doesn't mean we shouldn't resist patriarchy or racism. Uh, so you write, you know, our political movements should, our struggles against gender oppression are important because they're struggles against oppression, not because we have to establish them analytically first, which I think is a really important point. And I wonder if we could also shift the terms of the debate beyond that, though, in the sense that away from the analytical and towards the historical, we do see those connections very clearly, so for instance, between social reproductive work and a particular gender or between colonial accumulation and cap the capitalist accumulation and colonialism, does it then mean that our kind of focus should be a bit more on the historical rather than the abstract? So that the sharpness in this instance might come much more actually from 
doing that analysis at the more concrete level. Uh, and at the same time, I mean, I guess that was that was my reading, but at the same time, thinking through how the analytical level, though, remains clearly an important intervention that you want to make and how you think about those two alongside one another in a context such as that one. So thinking through colonialism or uh, social work production and gender, is there a particular importance that we might miss if we give up on the analytical kind of uh, intervention that you make? And I think my third question was uh, related also a little bit to something that Paul said, which was about the differences between economic power, ideology, and violence. So while reading the book, I was also thinking quite a lot about Gramsci's work, for instance. And I found it really uh, helpful, actually, that the way economic power speaks against um, both kind of consent and coercion and is a really helpful uh, third way of thinking about how power operates. And I wonder if there is similarly uh, a way in which you think about the relationship between these three tendencies. So I was curious, for example, with Gramsci, the way in which hegemony is very much tied to a balance between consent and coercion, where more consent implies perhaps more hegemony to oversimplify. Do you see a similar kind of balance of power between violence, economic power, and ideology, where if one declines or the power of one is in decline, the others kind of emerge as more important at particular moments? Um, and also, how do you see economic power in relation to Gramsci's idea of domination? Um, so similarly, the domination, I think, does in some writing have this idea of more quiet or slow forms of violence that might not appear immediately as coercive, but yet are doing that work of com compulsing, I guess, people into certain ways of living. Uh, and yet I think economic power is a much more interesting way of thinking about how that works beyond domination, that there's a much more complex uh, form of power that's operating there. So I was curious if you thought about it in relation to that notion of domination or whether you see it as something entirely um, separate from that. And my final question, if we have time, <laughs> uh, was about, I think, the really interesting point you make, which Paul also brought up, about time and temporality. So you write about kind of how debt in particular um, draws us into uh, paying for the future, in, in, in essence, that we are in the present, we give up the present in order to be able to live in the future. And uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about this idea of temporality or how you think about economic power and its temporalities, because I found that really interesting as well. I think there is a disruption of linear temporality there, but especially with the way you write about debt. Um, I was just curious if there was more on how you think about time, how, what economic power does to how we experience time, for instance. Um, and whether that's something that we could also think about in relation to something like resistance. But yeah, thank you. Let's hand over to Sue, maybe, last but not least. Thanks very much. Um, thank you, and um, of course, my apologies. Um, for uh, coming in late and not being able to hear uh, but the last sentence of, of, of your um, uh, of your introduction uh, to the book, sorry, and, and my apologies, but you know, institutional compulsions uh, also uh, have very peculiar subject responses uh, of various kinds, and I let's just say I was just you know grabbed by one of those. Okay, uh, I, I, I think that what I have to say actually echoes um, in great part of what's already been said uh, by Paul and Sarah uh, before, and um, so I'll try not to kind of um, go over some of that, um, which was that really, and it's, it's really helpful to know that we were sort of thinking along so many similar lines, which meant that, you know, such a generative uh, conversation that you've initiated um, uh, sorry. So first, can I just say that uh, I read the book with great uh, interest and I'm delighted also to be here, even though I'm late. I'm delighted to be here and to 
you know, haven't had the chance to listen to Paul and to Sarah uh, talking earlier. And like Sarah, I also thought there was a great pleasure actually to read uh, the book and also to learn so much from it. Uh, I agree that it was a very readable, very uh, nicely written. And, and, and I think that um, what I particularly really liked about the book was that I could actually sort of, you know, could see where Sarah was going. Right, and because he he was he's been so good at signposting, but also anticipating all the possible critiques that would come his way, and sort of dealing with them in a very quiet and patient and calm way, um, and sort of saying, you know, I, I know what you're going to say, but here's why, right? And then every time, this is what you'd say, I know what you're going to say, but here's why, um, and 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 actually, um, but also I thought that the book was really quite brilliant, and 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 now let me tell you why. Okay, in that book, I'm not, I'm not sure about you, but I always look for, um, you know, some element of this unexpected turn, right, that you're not hoping to find in a book. And when it comes at you, it just grabs you and you think, whoa, I wasn't thinking about that at all. So I knew where you were going, you were signposting so well, but I wasn't expecting this particular signposting. I wasn't expecting this particular turn. And so, and, and so what I'll do then is that I'll um, try and walk you with me to that unexpected turn, the moment of surprise for me, uh, and also try and think with Soren and the panel about three things, or actually now that Soren has already raised one of them, maybe two things uh, that I would like to um, raise with Soren some more, and I'm really curious to hear him talk about it a little more. So as Sarah was sort of pointing out, uh, uh, you know, right uh, at the beginning of a talk, uh, and also as Paul was, um, Soren's book project is really to ask, why is capitalism with us? This is the question, of course, that is asked by so many, uh, but not many pursue it with the theoretical clarity and perseverance that we see in mute uh, compulsion. <coughs> capitalism, Soren points out, has not only survived the destructive vicissitudes of the long 20th century, only to have emerged on the other side even more strengthened and as almost uh, the unchallenged behemoth, as it were. So why hasn't capitalism collapsed then? And Soren's answer is, well, quite simply, it lies in mute compulsion that economic relations exert on formerly free workers, or in other words, in the conditions created by prevailing economic power. Capitalist economy then is a system of power. And economic power is rooted in the ability to reconfigure the material conditions of social reproduction. As opposed to economistic frameworks, theories, and explanations, um, the economy, Soren argues, is not an autonomous, hermetically sealed off zone, but is in fact comprises a set of social relations and social through and through. And this point keeps being repeated over and over again. And I have to sort of say, I was very glad to hear social reproduction occur so many times in a Marxist text. But it's hardly the case, of course, that there aren't well-established and influential Marxist scholarship on power. Of course, you all know here that they, that's not the case at all. But Soren notes that this scholarship on power tends to refer exclusively to relations between social actors. But power is also a relation between social actors and emergent property of social relations on others. Both classical Marxists and Western Marxists, using Perry Anderson's uh, term and class classification, um, both have generally remained within the confines of violence ideology couplet. This is the quote from Soren. Neither managed to bring the economic power of capital to the fore. And therefore, the question that drives the book is, how is the power of capital operative even when we willfully remove ideological and coercive aspects of domination from the scene of power? Soren acknowledges, right, so this is his moment like preempting the critique and sort of saying, well, you know, acknowledges that his, of course, is a partial study of the power of capital because it focuses only on economic power and not on the theories of ideology and violence. And, but then Soren is also very quickly points out and he's very clear that his project is one of understanding capital and not Marxism per se. So that's why there are these boundaries drawn around uh, the project that he's doing. Um, but how do then the question occurs in the book, how do human beings and their lives end up being caught up in the mute compulsion of economic power? So yes, we have that, but how do human lives um, being, uh, you know, uh, end up being caught up. And in order to answer the question, Soran takes, undertakes an analysis of what he calls the social ontology of power. Now, to undertake such a, a social ontology of power means to track or trace economic power to the nature of social reality. 
So to tracking invariably involves tracing or tracking all the points in Marx's thinking in which he changes his minds on various things, right? And he changes his minds quite a lot, including on the role of human nature and the part it plays in the, his critique of political economy, Marx's critique of political economy. And of course, there's a lot of work done on that, right? Epistemic turn and, and, and so on. So what is the work then that a social ontological framework does in understanding this mute compulsion of power? You can see me kind of, you know, now sticking my feet in the ground and saying, okay, now tell me what is the work that this does. It enables quite a few things actually. For one, it helps show that the economy is not a separate sphere governed by a discrete economic rationality. That the economy is in fact a sum activity of processes through which social reproduction is organized and the logic through which these processes become social and historical. The economic sphere is one characterized then, as someone says, by the social functions and the activities which constitute it. It is these upon which the very existence of society depends. It is only in the capitalist mode of production where the accumulation of abstract wealth becomes the basis of social reproduction. In order for this to become possible, a, set, a certain set of social relations need to be in place. And this is, of course, where Marxist feminists have been exemplary in drawing attention to the social constitution of the economy, to the split between the formal economy and, between, and life itself. The radical separation between life and its conditions which allow, is what allows capital to insert itself as a mediator between them. In sum, economic power of capital rests upon the ability of capital to seize life by the roots and this I'm quoting from Soren, by the roots and entangle it in the logic of valorization. The reproduction of capital becomes the condition for the reproduction of life. It operates, if you like, as a form of biocapitalism, right? But this form of biocapitalism or biopolitical capitalism is quite distinct from a gambling. And, 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 and Soren, of course, goes into a discussion as to why that's the case. So far, so good, right? So far, so good. But how does Soren arrive at this particular mode of thinking? What is the route he takes to arrive at this particular socio-ontological thinking? And this is my big moment of being completely taken by surprise, and also one of big learning from the book in which I'm going to take forward with me. So this happens, right, this form of thinking happens when Soren begins a discussion on Marx's corporeal term. Right? So maybe my training as a political theorist meant that I never paid or I was never allowed to pay attention to Marx's corporeal term. He reminds us that Marx's <laughs> corporeal term has had few takers. And it is, in fact, one of the most neglected and overlooked aspects of his thinking. And I'm going to do a very short account of Soren's reading of this Marx's corporeal term, but just to say here very quickly that Marx's analysis of the body allows him to come to the conclusion that not only is the human body biologically undetermined, but also that it is <clears throat> utterly misguided to speak of an original unity between nature and the human. Now, this has all sorts of implications, right? You know what I'm, where I'm going. From conceiving the economy as a denaturalized space of social relations and to assigning particular subjects to social and to not assigning particular subjects to social reproduction in a naturalized mode, Soren reads the corporeal turn in Marx's thinking to suggest, and here he channels Michel Barrett, that biological difference cannot simply explain the social arrangements of gender. In short, there is nothing natural about the gender identity of those who are required to take up the position in the realm of social reproduction and consequently have their value extracted through social reproduction, right? Nothing natural at all. This is liberating in the sense that it derives from Marx no natural edict or law that suggests that extractive labor within capitalism is necessarily only to be performed by women, even though that is how the patterns pan out. But there is no, nothing natural about it. And as ever, of course, location and context is all. And one thing to note here, of course, that is that breaking the unity between nature and human, which Marx does through his corporeal turn, does not, in effect, of course, put an end to the practices which transform the labor of those humans who are subordinated by race and gender into the stuff of nature. In fact, that continues, right? And, and those hold steadfast these hold steadfast for vast swathes of humanity who continue to experience the collapsed distinctions between exploitation and violence and the removal from any minimal protections that an economic contract may have allowed, right, because of this breakdown of the unity. But that, of course, doesn't happen in the case of racialized um, and gendered peoples. So I also, at this point, so that's my 
take totally, I wasn't expecting the corporeal turn and the sort of, you know, the important part that it plays in, in, in organizing social reproduction. So I'm going to, at this point, I want to, I'm mindful I'm running out of time. I'm also mindful that I have three questions to ask, but I'm going to take to two because Sarah asked one on resistance already. And, and I want to ask, I want to go back again to the question of difference. That's chapter seven. And the work that difference does for capitalism. In chapter seven on capitalism and difference, you take up the question of gender and racial oppression in particular and ask whether, whether there is anything that is core to capitalism that can be said to increase gender and racial oppression. Right? That's the question. Is there anything that is core to capitalism that we can sort of derive gender and racial oppression from? Your reasoning is very clear. Your point essentially is that race and gender are not part of the whole structure of capitalism. And of course, you carefully point out that the, to say this is not that these are not core, is not, of course, uh, and that there is no logical connection between race, gender, and capitalism is not to say that capitalism is indifferent to oppression or, or to the processes of realize, uh, racialization. Or as you put it, it's perfectly possible to hold that racism is a social phenomenon which does not originate in the capital form, yet is reproduced by the latter. <coughs> I wonder, though, whether this position of insistence on origins, right, whether something can be derived something from, from something else, what is the origin of something, brings you perilously close to methodological abstraction of the kind that idealizes abstraction of the kind that is, of course, critiqued by Marx, right? Um, you do, of course, say that abstraction is important for theoretical coherences, but indulge me here. By, this, by, by when I say privileging methodological abstraction, I mean, and I hear I paraphrase Charles Mills, who says, and, and I derive from him, that the problematic mode of idealizing abstraction, which allows a turn away from social oppressions, and in a way that both conceals its extent and inhibits the development of conceptual tools necessary for dealing with its workings. So there are two things linked to abstraction and, and that possible difficulty around methodological abstraction that I want to bring uh, to, your, to, um, to the table today. And the first one is, and I imagine you've already thought about responding to these, right? I mean, you've probably thought about all of this. And, and particularly if, you know, your response to those who work on racial capitalism. There are several ways of thinking about racial capitalism from those who say there's no such thing as non-racial capitalism. So wrong. Right. Or those who will say that even while capitalism is not inevitably racialized, its emergence and rise coincides with the racialized differentiation of the world and its contemporary form is certainly racialized. And the other is, of course, to do with social reproduction and its link with social reproduction theory. You write eloquently about how capitalist mode of production has introduced a historic, a historically unique split between the production of goods and the reproduction of labor power. And that throughout the history of capitalism, most of the labor power required to uh, reproduce, most of the labor required to reproduce this labor power on a daily as well as intergenerational, and here's the temporality question, on an intergenerational basis has been performed by proletarian women. You prefer proletarian to, to the worker um, because people who work, many people who work do not receive a wage. But here as well, methodological abstraction comes up again in your argument and constricts you, I think, and I could be wrong and I could have misread this, uh, from deriving any of these specific relations and practices from capitalism itself. Now, in fact, you even argue that exploitation is linked to relations of production and not to the extraction of surplus value. And therefore, if we want to grasp the nature of class domination, we cannot rely on exploitation. Not least, as you explained, because the focus on exploitation tends to reinforce struggles for wage labor as the only proper and real form of class struggle. Instead of exploitation, you argue that we ought to understand class as a shared relation to the conditions of social reproduction, as this allows for a more expansive idea of class struggle. Now, so this is all fine. I, I'm very sympathetic to it, except I wonder that the shared uh, relations to the conditions of social reproduction are, of course, all relations enmeshed and entangled in very concrete practices of exploitation and oppression that attach in very particular and specific ways to particularly racialized sex and gendered bodies. Moreover, in the texts of social reproduction and the ones that you, that you cite, for example, Maria Mies, who suddenly passed on uh, this week, and indeed theories of racial capitalism, it is exploitation, or rather the conceptualization of the interrelated exploitations, which is fundamental and key to how they think capitalism reproduces itself, but also extracts value. And so having said all of this, I 
just towards the end, this is the last 30 seconds, like 40, 25 seconds. I wonder how far we can sustain the idea that, or even the faith, if you like, in class relations as shared, as, as class relations as shared relations uh, to the conditions of social reproductions in terms of solidaristic politics, given that the racialized and gender uh, sort of, you know, coding of both capital and indeed of the world exists in very particular ways that this sort of abstract asking for, you know, class um, relations as um, uh, uh, shared relations in the conditions of production may or may not be the most, um, should I say, may or may not be the most, uh, may not may be the most effective glue that binds struggles across the globe. Thanks very much. Thank you. you want to respond to any of this? Or <laughs> I'm just going to questions. Um, well, um, Thank you to all of you and so many good perspectives and there are a lot of questions and a, a lot of, um, I'm afraid it's going to be difficult for me to respond to all of it without uh, talking for way too long. So, um, but perhaps, do, do, do you want me to, should I make some comments now and then yeah and okay so let me try to respond to some of it at least. and uh, so there are a couple of things that all of you um, raised or questions that all of you raised um, I think so I think one of the questions let me just look at my notes for a second um, okay so one of the things I I think I have something to say about is the um, the relationship between different forms of power and how that has um, developed throughout history, the history of capitalism, and 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 how these forms of power relate to each other, which is not something which is something that I don't really write about in the book, and it's something that I've thought a lot about, but I don't really. I'm, I'm not sure that there's a general um, answer to, to that question. So um, I think sometimes Marx, in his writings, tend to, uh, to, to, he suggests sometimes that there is a tendency in capitalism to replace violence with economic power. So the uh, violence, and I think Paul, you mentioned that idea that um, that uh, economic power is something that uh, replaces violence and uh, so that there's a historical tendency in capitalism uh, in that sense. But I, I don't find that very convincing and I don't think it's a very, um, I think there's a danger of underestimating how important violence is for the continued reproduction of capitalism. And, uh, of course, as Marxist state theorists have always emphasized, the violence of the state is always necessary in order to um, uh, uh, to uh, guarantee property rights. So, uh, so I think it's so. I, I tried not to make any claims about any historical tendencies with regards to these different forms of power. But at the same time, I think it's also quite obvious that these forms of power do not play the same role in all historical situations in the history of capitalism, that at certain points in the history of capitalism, <coughs> violence has been more central, or ideology or economic power has been more central, and that there has been different configurations of these forms of power um, at various points in, in the history of capitalism. And I, I don't have a theory of that and I'm not sure it's possible to make a theory of that. I think there, it's it's. Uh, I think this is um, has to do with concrete historical situations and how things play out. And and uh, so so I don't think it's possible to um, articulate like a general uh, thing about that. Um, I I. I'm not going to make a general claim about that, at least. Um, so, 
Okay, so that was regarding the relationship between different forms of power. Uh, um, so another, well, I guess one of the most important things that all of you raised is the, the well, you could say the limitations of doing abstract, such an abstract analysis like the one I presented in the book and, or, or in what way that is useful. And this is, of course, something I have, I posed many of these questions to myself many times while working on this and it was, I, when writing the book, I felt like that it was, there was a constant uh, threat of like the project exploding in different directions because I constantly felt the need to um, draw in more historical content, more concrete content, and, and, and there are so many things that I don't really say anything about, which um, would complicate the picture so much if I began to, to for example, I, 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 I don't have a lot to say about the state and the fact that capitalism has always existed in a system of nation states which is obviously an extremely important aspect of capitalism. And, um, and I think that what, what one like the easy way to um, respond to this question would be to say that, would be to emphasize how the limits of what I'm trying to say, that I'm not trying to present a general theory of capitalism or general theory of capitalist, uh, the power of capital, that it's, it's just uh, a, an attempt to say something very general about one specific form of power and, and, and in that way try to minimize what I'm actually trying to say. Um, but I'm, I'm also, I also think that that would be too easy just to do that. Um, and, um, well, perhaps I will get back to this, but, but I'm, 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 I'm afraid I don't really have a good answer and I'm, uh, I, it's, it's like a constant doubt for myself why, in, in how useful is it actually to produce such an abstract uh, theory of capitalism. I, I, I think that, I think it has some usefulness and I think that if, if and, and if we want to, I think sometimes it can be a good idea, it can be useful to have like a, some very abstract general descriptions of how capitalism functions that can help us understand um, more concrete situations. Um, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure um, what else I have to say about that. Um, so I also want, briefly want to uh, respond to the question about resistance and political strategy. Um, I, um, as one of you mentioned, I. Um, argue in the book that we should avoid expecting, we, we shouldn't expect theory, theories at this level of abstraction to provide us with political strategy and that we should, um, we should build our strategies on concrete analyses of concrete situations uh, and that what abstract <coughs> theory like this can do hopefully is to build, to, to provide some concepts that can be helpful in producing those kind of more concrete analyses that could be strategically relevant. So I, so I try not to, uh, uh, on the one hand, not to draw strategic consequences from this analysis, but at the other hand, also insisting that you know, if, 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 it, if a theory doesn't have any kind of political relevance, then it's, there's no reason to do it. Um, so I think that one thing I want to mention is that I think uh, there is if we were to draw, draw a strategic consequence for how we struggle against capitalism from this analysis, I think it might have something to do with, with uh, something that has been uh, emphasized, especially by Marxist feminists, and also uh, the tendencies sometimes uh, known as communization theory, which would 
please to say that if we, we shouldn't imagine uh, the overcoming of capitalism or the abolition of capitalism as a process where we where first we dismantle capitalism and then there is a transitional phase where we build something else that um, that we that, that capitalism we can only abolish capitalism by uh, creating another way of living and another mode of reproduction uh, as we struggle against it because capital the power capital reproduces itself through uh, organizing the way we live on in the most fundamental basis a fundamental level of social reproduction and that's also where we need to um, uh, we, we need to immediately organize things in, an, in that in another way while uh, attacking capitalism. If that makes sense. So I think uh, the uh, communist thinker Jasper Burns uh, wrote in a recent article that one does not win this war against capitalism and then build communism. One wins the war against capitalism by building communism. Um, and um, so that's one, I think, possible strategic consequence of this kind of analysis. And, and uh, yes, um, so perhaps I should stop, stop here and then I, yeah, there are so many uh, good questions and, and, and reflections that I would like to comment on, but, but maybe I'll get back to some. Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, okay, let's take. Can you hear? Is this working? No. Um, okay, let's take questions. Uh, please, can we avoid the very long, um, you know, kind of theoretical exegesis or, you know, statement of, uh, you know, I don't know, some obscure theoretical uh, intensity, and rather ask the questions. Uh, so, questions. So, we'll start here, and then we'll If you could just start off saying who you are, um, and then you I'm Pete Green's my name. Uh, two questions. One, but also start with the defense of abstraction. But the question, in a sense, is a point that you make in the book, that Marx himself had problems with the levels of abstraction on which he was operating. For example, the question of competition. So there is an issue, and there's an ongoing debate. Um, I won't say what I think about it, but there is an issue in the whole, you know, about where do you like, where should Marx have located competition, and different Question, different levels of competition itself, in my view. The second question I have, but I, I am going to comment that I one thing I one, I read the book. One little bit I really didn't like was the bit about transcendental debt. Just to say that, but also uh, not saying why. But yeah, I, it's, 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 the question's coming because it's about debt. It's about the realities of debt relations, which are pervasive in capitalist society and this isn't just a new thing although people sometimes talk about it as if it's a new thing it's a very old thing and i think the question of debt and of money as power as a form of power not simply resource um, is something that you've left out and i think it's really unfair to talk about what you've left out because you've done so much but there yeah, that's the question <laughs> <coughs> hey, sir. Um, I'm a call. That's my name. Um, it's more of a comment than a question. No, it's just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's just a question about uh, a, a sentence you have at the conclusion. It says, uh, real subsumption also takes place outside the workplace on national, regional, and global levels, right? And you have your uh, section on real subsumption nature. There's some good commentary on that. Um, I just, my, when I read the bits on subsumption and capital a while ago, but to me it's, uh, it hinges on the labor process, right? You can't really have real 
formal real subsumption without a labor process. So when you say real subsumption exists outside of work, I, I wonder how you square this with Marx and with uh, the fact that while social processes might be transformed as a result of the real subsumption of labor or, or for formal and real and moving from agriculture and manufacturing into services, another area that I think could you look at more. How um, how do you, how do you justify using that sort of the expansive terminology? Um, thanks so much, Sam. That was that was really great to hear about, and also from the panelists, some of the same sort of comments and questions that I had. Mostly questions, I promise. Um, so. Uh, I have two questions. One of them is about your definition of violence. Um, so I understand that you define mute compulsion as the absence of violence insofar as um, the, the compulsion, the self-understanding of letting one be exploited is sometimes necessary. However, isn't this still um, to be understood as a form of violence, especially when thinking about you know, epistemic notions of what violence is, uh, really in particular, and I know Sumi mentions this sort of the black radical tradition and its understanding that certain people, depending on who they are, have to um, um, expose themselves to this particular mode of operation and exploitation. Again, thinking of it as a both epistemic form of violence as well as a real economic form of violence, but nevertheless still violence. The second question that I have is around um, your sort of casting aside of um, uh, uh, ideology. Um, because, of course, there's this notion of circularity of economic power and yielding this power, saying that this is also in itself the source of the power. But surely this emanates from the sort of cultural hegemony of the oppressor, and which then renders it ideolo ideological, right? Because you need to have a set of actors, now never mind that they are rendered anonymous, uh, anonymous that they are rendered obfuscated. They still have to emanate from a source. And so thinking about this, um, as ideological, I think is is important in being able to concretize what you're what you're drawing on, whilst appreciating that you're abstracting it. Yes. Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, I think I'll begin with the, or actually continue uh, trying to say something meaningful about the question of abstraction, methodological abstraction, and abstract theory and the defense of, of uh, abstraction. And it's, yeah, Marx definitely struggles with that problem a lot in his critique of political economy. And I don't think he ever solved it. There are so many places in his writings where he's in doubt about what to include and what not to include. And I, um, well, when, when I wrote this book, I tried to right, define capitalism in, in, in the, in, from the beginning and then uh, 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 trying to limit the project by only considering uh, forms of, of expressions of the economic power of capital insofar as they could be directly, like logically connected to that definition of capital. And that was, a, that was also a, like a method for for, well, limiting the project so that it would become manageable and, and it, would, it was possible to write a book about instead of, instead of trying to, you know, beginning to write something that would end up as a chaotic long manuscript that would never be finished. And, and, and but, but, so I, th and I think that I, when I began writing it, I, 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 I think I've maybe changed a my views on what theory is and what it, what theory is for since then a bit because now I'm, I'm thinking that um, and this is not I'm not sure this is very well thought through but I'm, I, I think I have a more pragmatist or pragmatic I mean in the, in the sense of like the philosophical tra tradition pragmatism pragmatic um, view of theory uh, uh, today so what so so and that, and I think that means that could also mean that it's the, the important thing is not necessarily to have like a, a methodologically extremely uh, consistent uh, theory, but but it's more a question of building theories that are relevant for what we want to do and what we want to know and how we want to use it. And I think in in in, in that light, I I should have. Perhaps have been 
less concerned with like being methodologically consistent throughout the, the book and, and like constantly trying to discuss whether this or that phenomena belongs to the core structure of capitalism or not, and instead have, have uh, thought more about how to make such a description of capital as relevant as possible for, for the readers. Or, um, and uh, yeah, so in, in, in that light, I think I, there are a lot of places where I would have wished to have more concrete content and, and historical content. Um, so, um, and okay, so I also want to briefly uh, comment on the, or uh, reply to the question about real subsumption. In the book, I uh, actually I, I, I spent some time criticizing the attempts to use the, the concepts of formal and real subsumption to uh, periodicize capitalism. Uh, and I think that, that the end notes collected, for example, have uh, they have uh, written a very good critique of that. Um, at the same, so 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 I start by uh, defending like a, what you would say was an orthodox uh, Marxological um, um, sense of that concept that it's something that only applies to the labor process. But then I then I uh, I think especially Andreas Merz and the eco more broadly the eco Marxist. Uh, use of that uh, concept to, um, to, to analyze more broadly capital, capital's relationship to nature is quite meaningful, actually. And, and, and you could also say that actually that it's already, in a way, it's already present in the use of that concept to analyze the labor process, because the labor process is also a natural process, because the worker is a natural Body and a, and a, and and, and uh, there are, for example, the, the the questions about the working the limits of the working day and stuff like that also implies the, the question about natural limits of the body and so on. So it's there's al already a question of manipulating nature when you're analyzing the labor process uh, through the concept of real abstraction. But um, I. Yeah, I think I, I think it makes sense to to um, to use that concept to analyze the production process more broadly, not just the labor process, but but the production process. But uh, but and and it, you know, I guess the alternative would be to uh, develop other concepts to to like say the same thing, and that could I yeah, I'm not sure that would be more useful. Um, so. And also a, a brief uh, reply to the question about the concepts of violence and ideology. I think um, lots of people have asked me whether I whether economic. Sometimes I get the question whether economic violence, economic uh, power, isn't like a form of violence, and sometimes I get the question whether it isn't it a form of ideology. And I and I guess my reply to both that those questions could, would be that yeah, we we could. We could con that's one way of conceptualizing it. I, I, you know, we could we could extend the or, or broaden the concept of violence and then speak of different forms of violence, economic violence, ideo ideological violence. That could make sense, and I and, and then just basically replace the concept of power with violence. Um, I just think that it's more useful to distinguish between it in this way. But but uh, but uh, yeah, that that's. In a way, that's related to what I just said about uh, I, uh, having a pragmatist relationship to theory. That it's, I, I think it's just a, a, an easier, uh, easier way to talk about this and, a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and easier to understand instead of distinguishing between different forms of violence. Because I think that there is a real difference. So, so it's, it's just a matter of how we want to conceptualize that. And I find it more useful to... Um, to distinguish between violence uh, or coercive power and ideological power and economic power. Wait. <coughs> <coughs> I think this has been very much covered by the last answer, but um, I was wondering if a view of ideology more as a set of practices rather than a set of kind of um, beliefs might lead you more towards um, the kind of um, account in which, um, well, or it blurs together kind of ideology and um, in, a, in a different way to ideology as a set of 
at least that one other time that yeah. wondered if that makes any difference. And I, I think I think it's kind of covered by and you could have either view, right, depending on what you wanted to use that kind of pragmatic approach for. Thank you so much for all this. Uh, John Shelker, no, it's the particular angle. Oh, right, yeah. Uh, I'm a professor here in the government department. Um, this is such a such a wonderful discussion to engage. A long theoretical discussion. No, I don't. Um, no, I just have a question, which is okay. So. Your, 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 your three answers to the abstraction challenge, the violence ideology challenge, and the other challenge about um, uh, political strategy, you, you sort of say, look, um, uh, what I'm doing is quite, is quite limited. Um, it's, just put that to one side. What, what I'm doing is quite limited, you said in a very sort of modest way. I'm looking at economic power. My sort of abstract methodology can only get us so far. I haven't really grounded a politics of resistance. And that all sounds, I mean, I thought that all sounded very congenial uh, and very interesting. Uh, and, I, and I sort of think maybe that, that, that could create a sort of articulation with other kinds of struggles, because you're not trying to kind of monopolize the field and say, this is my totality. But how do you square that with the other part of what you said, which is the economy is not a separate realm. This kind of metabolism between man or body and nature, which is then mediated through capitalism, has this kind of fundamental uh, presence. And so that sounds like when Nancy Fraser does that, she's talk she talks about capitalism as she sort of expands her theory to kind of include everything else. But your, your gesture is, seems more to say, no, no, I'm, I'm just coming at it from this corner and it's limited and, and, and you know. Uh, and so is that, can you help us like make sense of that? Isn't that a bit of a contradiction? Like to say on the one side, no, I'm just looking at economic power, violence, ideology, not to mention civil society are sort of in some other place. But, um, but actually the sort of way capitalism subsumes our means of social reproduction is somehow fundamental and, and structuring, which and it's that latter one that is so often the hallmark of Marxism, right? So uh, we, you know, are you, how do we, is that a contradiction or is it a productive tension or how, how should we understand that possible aporia in, in what you just said? Any other questions? Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ron. Um, Angus Manelli. Um, it sounds like an amazing book, and it sounds like you started a PhD with just like a crazy, crazy idea. Right? <laughs> so what I wanted to know more about was like, how did you arrive at this? I mean, it seems like a very mature book for someone so so young to write. So I wondered whether you, whether you could talk about a little bit about like the process of like how you got there um, and, and what led you down that path. Okay, um, thanks. Um, so uh, I'll begin with the question, the, the second question. And if I have understood, I'm not sure I understood completely what, <coughs> You said, but um, I'll. I hope I, I understood some of it. Um, and uh, so, when I presented the book today in the beginning, I actually skipped the entire first part of the book, which uh, uh, some of you brought up, which is about the, the analysis, the discussion about human nature and uh, the, the the body and the corporeal turn in Marxist writings and 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 all of that. This, what I call the social ontology of economic power, and what that part of the book does is to it, it tries to explain why such a thing as economic power is possible at all. Why? What is it about the human being that? And what what is it about human beings that allows their reproduction to be organized through such a thing as economic power? And actually, I think, well, first of all, that was I think it was the most most interesting hard for me personally yeah, to work on, and that's and the, the research I'm working on now, uh, uh, it builds a lot on that. Um, but in a sense, it's I, I, I also think it's not strictly necessary for the main project of the book, which is to say something about how 
the economic power of capital works. And in order to do that, it's not necessary to explain why it's possible. Because you could, it would be possible just to start from the fact that it is possible and then explain how it works. So in a, in a, in a sense, I think that, that well, so the, so the book is, um, there are three parts of the book, and the second, the, the, the first part is the more philosophical one about uh, human nature and uh, uh, the social ontology of economic power, and then the second and third part of the book uh, are about how the economic power of capitalism works. And in a sense, the second and third part of the book is a very limited project to say something very specific about a specific form of power uh, on a specific level of abstraction and so on. But the first part of the book is actually has some, makes a, some claims that are much larger in a sense about what human nature is, for example. So, uh, yeah, so that, so that's, so you're right that there is a tension uh, or uh, there's a big difference between those two projects. Um, <coughs> uh, I guess that's all I have to say about it. Okay. Uh, um, but um, then, um, briefly on the question of how I arrived uh, at this project, I think I began by wanted to. I, I began by with an idea that I wanted to read as much as as many of Marx's uh, writings as possible, and then try to like. Um, note everywhere he talks about power, and then trying to con to make some kind of um, 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 like an overview of Marx's con Marx's conception of power. Um, and 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 uh, but then I I realized that that was a, a too large a project, and then and and uh, <laughs> I could, I think that's. <laughs> Quite yeah. common thing for when you begin a PhD, you have an idea, and then you and then you gradually narrow it down more and more because it's it's uh, there's always so many things to uh, to consider and too much to consider. And then I I just uh, I wanted to do like a, a typology of forms of power in, 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 on the basis of Marx's writings, and then uh, I just uh, found the economic power thing more interesting than writing about ideology and violence, because I think a lot of things more have been written about that. So, so I decided to focus on that, and then I gradually, one of the things I, one of the problems I had was that it was like there was a tendency for the, it's based on a PhD thesis, yeah, as you've said, I think. Um, um, and there was, I, I had to constantly, uh, uh, fight with my own tendency to make it into a Marxological uh, work about what, like a, a book about what Marx meant about this, and I tried to move away from that, so it, and not only, not to make it a work about, um, not to make it a book about what Marx thought about economic power, but how economic power works, and drawing in other resources also. So, yeah. Any other questions? Um, just quickly. I don't know if this is on. Can people hear me? I think it's working. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just wanted to pick up on what you said about crisis, because um, it's something I think about a lot in my own work. But you know, you talk about the increasing ability of crisis to kind of co-opt the potential changes that it might spark, like capitalism peddling the solutions to capitalism. And I was wondering, I know others have asked you kind of about the more practical side of your of your, uh, of your contribution. This isn't really about that. This is how you're thinking about change within a system that can appear with the reproduction of economic power to be quite closed. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you're thinking about theorizing power or like changes in power within these, these uh, seemingly closed systems. Hi. Hello. Can is it on? <laughs> Mike, okay, whatever. I'll try to speak up either way. Uh, so thank you. Um, I had this question from before, but uh, your answer just now about your process, I think, feeds into it slightly. Um, basically, uh, I was intrigued by 
your claim, and full disclosure, I haven't read the book yet, but by your claim that um, no political program follows from this like analysis at this level of abstraction um, with the uh, economic power. And it reminded, <clears throat> sorry, it reminded me of uh, the work of uh, Agnes Heller on Marx's theory of need. And uh, from what I could tell, her method was to basically go through Marx's corpus, underline every time he uses the word need, and then figures out what's going on with that. So I think there's a parallel there. But um, her argument is basically that um, capitalism universalizes need so that the proletariat doesn't need particular things. It comes to, through real subsumption, need only the wage. And so it's a unique form of, a historically unique form of dependency uh, in which <coughs> needs are collated into one type of need which is an economic need. And then that is, in her argument, the root of the revolutionary potential of uh, the proletariat. She was a student of Lukács. So I guess my argument, or my question rather, is, because um, no argument, um, is, I guess, do you, why do you feel that no political program follows from the theory that you lay out if, um, your theory is basically the idea that capitalism interposes itself between our bodies and our bodily needs, um, and then therefore produces new needs and universalizes these needs, if that makes sense. And if you're not familiar with the work, feel free to discount the question. I mean, what the question is, uh, yeah. Let's do it without the microphone. I'll speak up. Um, it's good for the for the recording, though. You <laughs> want here now? Okay, I don't care about people on here. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I want to pick up on this this that Heller question as well, and I'm going to try and avoid terminology and try and be crude and play. I uh, I'm kind of concrete, right? I as I, as I read you, like what you mean by new compulsion is the hunger is real, right? That in spite of like surplus production, the vast majority of people on the world in the world like go hungry, do not have what they need for their lives to be for their needs to be fulfilled, for their lives to be like fulfilled. Uh, and that this situation of uh, like, invariable competition mediated by wages is, is is kind of what you're describing. Um, now I would like, where Heller goes with this, I think, is, is interesting, and I, I like, have this worry, which is that there is a there is a political conclusion to the argument you make, which is a kind of conclusion of like welfareism or social wage, right, which would decrease economic power in these terms, or otherwise like McDonaldization, like you know feed people but degrade the conditions of the fulfilment of needs, right. Everyone gets to eat, but what you get to eat is like worse. And, and so, one answer to reduce economic power would be like they really don't bad monopolies that degrade the lives of people. That would seem that looks like a solution to the like, economic power problem. And that, so, that's one side of my question. The other side of my question is that if what you mean is simply just like hunger is real, right, that that is a condition that is preserved by. States or the organization of capital. Now, why do I need Marx to say this and to talk about it? Why do I need all the quotes? Why do I need to go through the grid of this? This is a like, more basic question than needing all the Marxology. Uh, I'm not sure that you need that. I mean, I, 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 I think it's useful to read Marx and Marxist thinkers if you want to have a better understanding of why. People go hungry, but uh, but it's not like I think it's necessary to read Marx in order to uh, struggle against capitalism or anything like that. So, um, and uh, it's not just well, people don't have what they need, and, and uh, because of capitalism, and that uh, part of that is that a lot of people go hungry. Yes, but also people who don't go hungry, but in other ways don't have what they need, are also. So Subjected to the, the power of capital and uh, the economic power of capital, and um, and I think the, and, and and the only way to um, 
The only way to get rid of that would be to establish a, um, a, a, a democratic control of the conditions of social reproduction, uh, which would entail not 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 some kind of a, not just a social democratic welfare state, but abolishing capitalism. Um, and uh, so, and, and on the question of of which. Uh, both of you, or several of you, have raised about uh, the, whether or not this analysis implies a political program. I think, of, of course, it implies an anti-capitalist program. Uh, so it implies that capitalist, the capitalist economy is a system of domination. And if we want to create uh, something like a free and democratic society, it has to. And it it, 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 it uh, involves the abolition of capitalism. And another, um, more concrete. Uh, uh, political uh, consequence of that analysis is that market socialism is not uh, is, is not a, a solution because the market is a, it relies on class domination and the market is itself a form of domination. So I also think that my analysis implies a political program which uh, is incompatible with um, market socialism. Um, so uh, in that sense, that there is a political program, but so there's an anti anti capitalist political program, but but it's but it's not a very specific uh, anti capitalist program. Um, so uh, regarding the question about crisis, I'm I'm and, and and how to think about change, I'm not sure I I completely understood the question. Uh, was it about how crises, was it about change within capitalism, or are you talking about changes from capitalism to another mode of production, or? No, I'm, to clarify, I'm asking about, you know, in the condition that we find ourselves in now, particularly sort of after the pandemic, I think a lot of us who sort of situate ourselves on the left we're thinking about this as a potential yeah. crisis that might spark something outside of what we're what no. we're used to, and so I think in my own work, I really struggle to conceptualize change within mm. these frameworks, which I find which you put forward and I find so compelling. And I was just wondering if you sort of mm. are, are thinking about how to think outside yeah. of the <coughs> reproduction of um, you know these forms of capital because yeah. um, I really struggle with that. So. Well, on, on the one hand, I try to thank you, but, and, and, and on the one hand, I try to um, I on the one hand, I argue that crises can and often are uh, um, a way for a method for capitalism to reproduce itself and to um, prepare the or to, gen to create the conditions for a new round of accumulation um, because it because economic crises uh, uh, implies often uh, for example downward pressure on wages and increase uh, increasing uh, levels of unemployment and uh, uh, pressure on capitals to expand into new markets um, so uh, so in the history of capitalism crisis has uh, has often have often been followed by uh, uh, capitalist expansion, but at the same time, I I don't want to. I'm not saying that uh, crises can be reduced to that. I think that perhaps there has been a tendency among uh, uh, revolutionaries to uh, to maybe underestimate uh, that uh, the aspect of crises. I mean how it functions in the reproduction of capitalism, but that does not mean that it's that it can that crises can be a revolutionary opportunity or an opportunity to change something. Um, so uh, so I, I I try to think of crises as a as a risky uh, strategy for capital to restore conditions for profitable production, but nevertheless it is that, but it's a risky way of doing it. It's not like capital has a choice or anything like that. It, it, and it, it's a it, crises are a, a necessary um, expression of the contradictions of capitalist production. So, so crises open up possibilities, but not only for 
anti-capitalists, also for capital. Okay, we're out of time, so I don't know, I would like to just invite if any of the four of you have any final words you want to, to say, or any points that have been missed, or if Sarn wants to... Uh, lots, of, lo I, I, lots of points that have been missed, I mean, I so, so many um, uh, things I haven't responded to, but uh, yeah, I hope we can continue having these discussions elsewhere, and uh, yeah, thanks. thank you so much. For okay, let's thank you, Sarn, and our other people.